Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this playlist, we're going to be discussing two of the more primitive senses, and those are gustation and olfaction, which in layman's terms are taste and smell. And in this video, we're going to discuss gustation. And so first, let's talk about relevant anatomy. All right, so I think when most people uh, think about taste, they usually associate it with the tongue, and yes, there are many, many taste buds with taste receptors on the tongue. There's a few other structures that also have taste buds on them, which include the soft palate in the back of the oral cavity, also the epiglottis, and then there's even some in the pharynx and the upper esophagus, believe it or not. But it is true that the vast majority of taste buds are located on the tongue. So this round structure right here, this is actually the taste bud, and it's composed of multiple different types of cells, which we'll discuss in a few minutes. Uh, this taste bud is housed within layers of stratified squamous epithelium, which is, of course, the tissue that composes the tongue. Okay? So if we look at this, uh, in the deeper parts, this is, of course, the underlying connective tissue associated with the tongue. Over here in this white region, although it's not labeled, this is essentially just the oral cavity. Okay. And of course, the oral cavity, i.e. the mouth, is where you're consuming the food and chewing it and breaking it down. Now, I don't need to convince you of this, but food, of course, is made of millions and millions and millions and millions of individual molecules. And it's those molecules individually that are actually sensed by the cells of the taste bud. And so if we look at the taste bud, at least the proximal end of it that's actually closest to the oral cavity, we see a gap in the epithelial tissue, a hole. So the molecule that's going to be sensed in this context is referred to as a tastant. Okay? So this tastant molecule, whatever it is, is going to move from the oral cavity through this hole, which we refer to as the taste pore, and there it can interact with specific receptors on these cells. And these cells that sense the tastant are referred to in two ways. One of the terms, the most common one, is a gustatory epithelial cell. Now that can be kind of a, a tongue twister or at least hard to remember, so I usually refer to them as gustatory receptor cells, okay, or taste receptor cells. That's essentially what these are. These are cells that respond to different tastants and they are therefore receptors. Okay? Now if we look at the proximal end of these taste receptor cells, they have little cilia called gustatory hairs. And it's actually these hairs, or cilia, that contain the receptors for particular tastants. Okay? Now, we'll cover this in a couple of slides, but understand this, that each one of these taste receptor cells responds to a particular kind of tastant. So we're going to learn that there's five, possibly six different kind of tastes that we can have, okay, general tastes. And some of those include sweet, salty, sour, okay. Um, let's suppose that this taste receptor cell, it has receptors specifically for sweet. So let's suppose we get some sucrose in our mouth. Sucrose is a sugar. It's, of course, sweet. Sucrose can enter through this taste pore. Okay, from the oral cavity, move through the taste pore, and interact with those receptors that are on the gustatory hairs, specifically on the cell that detects sweet. But here's a question. Would the sucrose want to interact with the receptors on, let's say, a sour cell? Let's say this one adjacent to it is a cell that detects sour stimuli. Well, no, because from a simplistic point of view, and I'm simplifying it maybe a little bit too much, but each one of these cells responds to a different stimulus. Okay, Maybe one is sweet, one is sour, one is umami. We're actually going to see what that means in a few minutes. Okay, So hopefully that makes sense. We also see on the distal end here, closer to the connective tissue, some neurons associated with each of these taste receptor cells. Okay? So these neurons will eventually converge into a gustatory nerve, and then those gustatory nerves will converge with a specific cranial nerve, and we'll actually see those on the final slide. There's also cells called basal cells here. The basal cells are basically stem cells that can divide to replace damaged or old gustatory epithelial cells, which remember were the taste receptor cells. Okay? So hopefully this gives you a good understanding of at least the anatomy here. Okay? But just so you can get a general idea of what's going to happen as we go forward, 
So again, let's say we have a sweet tastant, let's say it's sucrose. Sucrose is in the oral cavity. It's gonna move through the taste pore and interact with the receptors on the gustatory hairs of the cell here, the taste receptor cell that's specific for sweet. And then this cell has a specific neuron associated with it. Let's call it just hypothetically or arbitrarily a sweet neuron. So when this gustatory epithelial cell or taste receptor cell becomes activated by the presence of sucrose, it sends information through this neuron to the brain. And so the brain would detect that we've got something sweet in our mouth. And it would be the same thing for any other kind of stimulus. All right. So now let's take a look at the five major tastes that we have. What I wanted to emphasize here, this whole thing is supposed to be just one taste bud. The taste bud has individual taste receptor cells for all the senses, okay? So let's look at this. We have sweet here. A good example of molecule that would stimulate a sweet cell would be sucrose. The second taste sense that we have is what's called umami. Now, umami is a Japanese word. And it basically is a meaty taste, okay? And the amino acid that actually triggers this is glutamate. Um, and this is actually why in a lot of um, Chinese restaurants in particular, uh, you'll often hear that they've added monosodium glutamate or MSG to their foods, okay? Um, umami is a taste that actually for humans is really, really good and we like it. And so they add that glutamate or MSG to the food in order to stimulate those umami uh, receptors. So this would be a taste receptor that's sensitive to glutamate, but it would be called umami. The third sense here is actually that of bitter. So this type of taste receptor cell would respond to bitter tastes. Uh, the kinds of compounds that tend to activate this are alkaloids. This is a very general class of compounds. Um, it's thought that the bitter sense is really more of a survival mechanism than it is for uh, positive taste or whatnot. Um, a lot of alkaloids and things that would activate a bitter receptor, those are poisons. And so if we are able to taste something as bitter, we would know to spit it out. Okay? There are some things bitter that we can eat, um, but this is thought more to be a survival taste. All right, the fourth one is, of course, salty. I think we all know that salty, salt is sodium chloride, so it makes sense that sodium ions are what activate a salt receptor. Okay. And the last one shown here is the sour receptor. Um, sour is due to acidity, and so H plus or hydrogen ions, these actually activate the sour receptor. Um, also understand that usually on the outsides, the superficial parts of the taste bud, we also have other cells called support cells, which actually can serve to feed the metabolic needs of the interior taste receptor cells or gustatory epithelial cells. And notice that each one of these has a neuron associated with it that converge into a gustatory nerve, but eventually those converge into a particular cranial nerve. We'll see three major ones later. The other thing I wanted to mention here is that when each of these cells become activated, uh, they're going to release a particular molecule, which is what's going to activate the neuron associated with it. What's important to see right here is that the sweet receptor, the umami receptor, and the bitter receptor, they all release ATP. And it's ATP that actually activates the, their particular neurons. However, the salty and sour cells, these actually release a different substance called serotonin. And serotonin then activates their corresponding neurons. Okay. Now, we're about to look at their individual biosignaling pathways, which are all fairly similar. But before we do that, I want to actually blow this up real quick. Um, this is actually something that's been disproven. This is not really true. Um, this is what's called a taste map. And they used to think this was something about the tongue, where, let's say, in the back, this is where bitter things were sensed, sours kind of in the middle, and then salty and sweet are more in the front of the tongue. This has since been disproven, because now we know that there's taste buds all over the tongue, and they're actually made up of all of these different gustatory epithelial cells that respond to a variety of stimuli. So the taste map is something that is not valid anymore. Now, in terms of biosignaling, we're going to look at these first three together, and we're going to see that they signal in an almost identical fashion. The only difference is the initial receptor and, of course, the stimulus. Right? So we're going to see that they're practically identical. And these three stimuli, sweet, umami, and bitter, are all going to signal through a G-protein coupled receptor. 
Okay, so I'm really just going to go over this first one and then we'll kind of just see that the other two are identical. So we have a receptor here that responds to sweet stimuli. Now these receptors, particularly the sweet uh, GPCR, uh, these have broad specificity, which makes sense because we know that there's a variety of things in our diet that can be sweet. Some of the most common ones to think about would be sucrose, which is table sugar, and fructose, which is fruit sugar. And of course, we can consume things that have high fructose corn syrup, which contains mostly fructose, but also a lot of sucrose. But also, different things like synthetic artificial sweeteners, aspartame, cyclamates, uh, these can also activate the sweet receptor. And what we see whenever this G protein coupled receptor becomes activated, well, it's a G protein coupled receptor, so it has a G protein. So whenever one of these molecules binds to this receptor, the G protein becomes activated and sort of moves over here and activates this enzyme, PLC. This is called phospholipase C. It's associated with the plasma membrane, and what phospholipase C does is it converts this phospholipid, which I have it shown down here, but it's really in the membrane up here. This is called phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate. For obvious reasons, we just call it PIP2. And phospholipase C breaks it apart into IP3. IP3 stands for inositol trisphosphate, or if we're really being technical, inositol 1,4,5-trisphosphate. IP3 is an important second messenger. So what IP3 does, generally, is it goes to the endoplasmic reticulum, that is the smooth ER. And there are IP3 receptors on the membrane of the smooth ER. And when IP3 binds to that receptor, you get a massive influx of calcium into the cytoplasm. Now with this calcium in the cytoplasm now, this calcium is going to come over here and bind to this protein called TRPM5. And when it binds here, TRPM5 becomes activated and it's a channel and it opens. And this allows sodium to influx into the cytoplasm. So recall that sodium is naturally more concentrated in the extracellular fluid, so when TRPM5 becomes activated and opens due to calcium, sodium rushes in down its concentration gradient and floods the cytoplasm with sodium. Then the sodium activates this protein called PAN-X1. PAN-X1 is an ATP transporter. Now obviously ATP is more concentrated in the cytoplasm because it's the inside of the cell where we make that, whether it's via glycolysis or the respiratory chain. So when this channel PANX1 opens, ATP moves down its concentration gradient from the inside to the outside of the cell, which is pretty handy because we have a neuron right here that actually responds to ATP. And so what this allows for is whenever sucrose or fructose or something sweet is present in the mouth, whenever the particular receptor on that gustatory epithelial cell senses it, that cell just releases ATP and activates the neuron which goes to the brain and tells the body that we've got something sweet. Okay? Now I'm going to kind of gloss over these two right here because they're pretty much the same. The only difference is we have a different receptor for each and a different stimulus. So remember that umami is a Japanese term that basically means savory or meaty. And so a lot of meats or meat tasting things contain plenty of the amino acid glutamate. This is again why a lot of restaurants, particularly Chinese and Japanese restaurants, add MSG or monosomy glutamate to the food because it increases the umami taste and actually stimulates this receptor more. And there's something in the brain where humans in particular really like the umami taste. Okay. So glutamate binds to the umami G protein coupled receptor and everything else is identical. You get ATP released and that will tell the brain that we've got something with glutamate in our mouth, something meaty. Again, same thing here with the bitter taste. Here we have the bitter G protein coupled receptor. The bitter receptors bind compounds like alkaloids. These are not the only kind, but alkaloids are very common. Um, remember that the bitter taste is thought more to be a defense mechanism because many poisons, things that we shouldn't have, are bitter in taste, and so we would know to spit those out if we sense something like an alkaloid present in the mouth. Okay, Although not all of them are poisons, and we do eat some things that are a little bit on the bitter side. Okay, In the same way, ATP is released, and that tells the brain hey, we've got something that's bitter. Okay? So the nice thing about these three senses is they're practically identical. 
okay? The only difference is the identity of the receptor and, of course, the stimulus, okay? Now, the last two are a little bit different. These are sour and salty. We're going to talk about sour first. So sour, as I mentioned, is due to acidity. So we have to have hydrogen ions present. So one really good example of a sour drink, I actually like these and it's uh, not a very good thing, are those green monster energy drinks. They're absolutely delicious. They're very acidic. And they, they have some sugar in there, right? Um, so you do activate the sweet receptor back on the previous slide, but they're very acidic. And so you can actually taste the acidity and therefore it's sour. So that would actually operate via this mechanism. So again, the sour cells, those gustatory receptor cells, they have potassium channels. Now these potassium channels by default are open, okay? So when there's no acid in the mouth, these potassium channels are open and potassium will continuously efflux out of the cell. Remember that potassium is normally more concentrated inside cells. So to diffuse down its concentration gradient, it would diffuse from the inside out. And this process will normally keep occurring and that will continue to hyperpolarize the cell and keep it inactive, okay? This potassium channel is a little bit different though. This is a hydrogen ion sensitive potassium channel or we might call it a proton sensitive potassium channel. The reason that's relevant is because when you eat something that's sour that has hydrogen ions in it, hydrogen ions inhibit this channel, okay? That's why it's a proton sensitive potassium channel. And so potassium can no longer efflux out of the cell because hydrogen ions inhibit this channel. So basically what happens here is when potassium can't efflux, you no longer have hyperpolarization. And so the membrane potential actually becomes a little bit more positive. And it becomes positive enough to where this calcium channel then opens. So when this calcium channel opens, calcium influxes because calcium diffuses down its concentration gradient into the cell. And then the calcium will trigger exocytosis of vesicles containing serotonin. That's what I'm trying to show here. This thing right here is a vesicle, contains serotonin. And so when calcium comes in, you get exocytosis of serotonin. And for sour sensation, these neurons are sensitive to serotonin. And so when they sense serotonin, they tell the brain, hey, we've got something sour. Okay, so this type of sense actually works by inhibiting the proton sensitive potassium channel. All right, in the case of salty food, we have, of course, sodium ions in the oral cavity. Now, in this case, sodium ions can diffuse through this sodium channel right here down their concentration gradient. And so initially, sodium will build up inside the cell. And when sodium builds up, it can activate this calcium channel over here, which is pretty much the same as this one over here in the sour sense. And actually, from this point on, everything else is the same as it was over here. So sodium activates this calcium channel, then calcium influxes, and that calcium triggers the exocytosis of vesicles containing serotonin. And of course, the serotonin binds to this neuron and activates it, and that tells the brain, hey, we've got something salty, okay? So I would say these two mechanisms are a little bit different, mostly the same, and so I kind of group them together. These ones over here for sweet, umami, and bitter are awfully similar, okay? The only difference there was the identity of the receptor and the initial stimulus. Now, before we go to the last slide, I want to come back here just for a minute, look at these taste buds. There's actually thought to be another sense, and I'm not sure if it actually involves a different cell type or if it involves another one of these, but it's actually the sense of fat. Um, humans actually like the taste of fatty acids, and it's thought that fatty acids actually represent another type of sense. Um, they actually activate a receptor called CD36. Um, I'm not going to talk about that here because it's not super well understood, but understand that there is another sense for fat. And humans, we like that. Okay? I may come back in another video if I can find some good information on that. But now, in terms of getting that information on taste to the brain, Okay. We talked about all these neurons right here. These neurons receive information from these taste receptor cells and they transmit it to the brain. Now initially for a particular taste bud, uh, these neurons converge into gustatory nerves. But I mentioned the gustatory nerves will converge into specific cranial nerves. Okay. Let's actually look at this. Um, if we look at 
uh, the facial nerve, which is cranial nerve 7, this is going to receive sensory information from the taste buds on the anterior two-thirds of the tongue and from the tip to the line of the circumvallate papillae. So the circumvallate papillae are kind of right here. Okay, uh, They kind of mark the boundary between basically the lingual tonsils up here, which is in the posterior one-third, and the anterior two-thirds. So basically the facial nerve innervates all this over here. If we then look at this blue one, the glossopharyngeal nerve or cranial nerve 9, this innervates the circumvallate papillae, which are right here as I just mentioned. They contain taste buds. And then the posterior one-third of the tongue. Okay, so all this back here is innervated by the glossopharyngeal nerve. And then finally, if we go to the very back, uh, there's actually taste receptors, or taste buds, I should say, on the epiglottis. And so the vagus nerve, or cranial nerve 10, receives the sensory information from that. So you can see that there's actually different cranial nerves that receive information from different parts of the oral cavity, particularly the tongue and the epiglottis. But regardless of who gets the information, they all send it to the same place. Okay? All of these sensory nerves are going to send that information to a nucleus in the medulla oblongata called the solitary nucleus. Okay? Now, when they're at a particular solitary nucleus, there's two of them, a left and a right, you're actually going to have crossing over in the medulla. Remember the medulla, actually, you have decussation of pyramids, so the, most of those uh, tracts actually cross over. And so they cross over and enter the medial lemniscus of the medulla oblongata. And from there, then they synapse in the thalamus. So generally, if you have something, I'll assume this is actually uh, the patient's right. If you have it in the right solitary nucleus, generally it will end up going to the left thalamus. Okay? And from the thalamus, then it sends that information to the gustatory cortex of the insula. Okay? So the gustatory cortex is the part of the cerebral cortex that simply detects taste. Now, of course, you'll also have a gustatory association area, and from there, information can be sent. Also, the thalamus can send information to parts of the limbic system, and so you can have emotional responses as well to the taste. Okay, so hopefully this makes sense to you and you understand a little bit more about gustation. In the next video, we're going to go over olfaction, which is smell. And we'll find that it actually is very, very similar to what we see in taste. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.